Hello and welcome to Hobson Bros. This week we're taking a deeper dive into barrel bacteria, barrel organisms. For an open window on a crappy world Max and Chris from Ups and Brews Ups and Brews Welcome to Ups and You're sitting at home bored and you want to try a new pastime. Maybe home brewing is for you. Not only will it, you know, take the time that you are brewing, but it's also going to become a part of your life. You're going to think about brewing all the time, uh, and, and clearly you won't be bored anymore. The perfect spot to start that is Brew HQ. Uh, the the main factor I would say is their online delivery. So you get to start home brewing. You don't have to move. You don't have to go anywhere to buy. Equipment, buy ingredients, buy references, buy anything. You can just order it from Brew HQ and then receive it. Uh, it's, it's the perfect way to start this pastime. I mean, don't do bread, don't do sourdough. Well, you can if you want to as well, but try beer. Beer's awesome. Plus, you get to drink it at the end. If you use the product uh, product code, the uh, checkout code BROS, you'll have 10%. So you're able to start a new pastime, uh, become obsessed with it, and, and not have to spend as much money. You're actually doing it for a discount. Check out BROS. Uh, check out Brew HQ for your home brewing needs. Go for it. Time to start. All right. So this week on Upsend Bros, we're discussing barrel bacteria. Why barrel bacteria in specific is because for us, it's quite important, but also one very interesting thing that it's not often really looked into when we're talking about beers, especially wild yeast or sour beers, because it's all in there and it adds some fantastic wood notes to your beers. But barrels have been used for many, many years, thousands and thousands of years, uh, even uh, an historian back in the Roman times, um, Pliny the Elder is name, if it rings a bell for you, stated how many drinks were conserved into those barrels to keep them for a longer period of time, but also used for many usage because wooden barrels were an easy container for a lot of different liquids or solids. So Max, how does it work with beer, wooden barrels, the bacteria in there, how can it change or evolve your beer in a good way? Yeast and bacteria. Uh, as you guys know, beer is basically four ingredients. At least if you are in Germany and you follow the Rheinhenskabat, it can only be four ingredients. Uh, water, malt, hops, and yeast. Uh, anywhere else in the world, you can kind of use other ingredients. A lot of people have been using different fruits to add to their beers. I mean, there's uh, lactose that's been added. There's a lot of stuff. People are playing around and using some weird stuff out there. Uh, but... At its core, beer is four ingredients, and those four ingredients will impact the flavor tremendously. It's not something that the macro brewers like Labatt and Molson think about. Uh, they basically just have, I, I believe for their ale, it's like, why? No, I, I don't know. Anyways, they have ale yeast and lager yeast, and that's it. It's just the those, those two entities, and they don't really play around with it. They want something, they want a product that is consistent, that is always going to be fermenting the same way and varying those yeast strains. It's not only compl complicated to keep those strains alive, but also you're going to have a lot of different flavors coming from that. That's not what they're looking for. But if you're a craft brewer, the yeast, is one of those four ingredients, is extremely important. Not only if you're brewing a very specific style, but in general, if you're looking for a specific flavor, mouthfeel, or, or fermentation process. Uh, recently, there's been some uh, breweries that have used Kvike. Kvike is a Norwegian style yeast uh, that is a little different. It's a little different than your traditional yeast that's been used over here. But today it's not that. Today we're talking about barrel, barrel bacteria and whatever you'll find in barrels. All right, let's get started. So uh, the reason why this came about is a few weeks ago, we did a video on Flanders Red. Flanders Red, its particularity compared to the Oud Brun is that it uses barrel aging. Barrel aging is awesome. It adds a lot of complexity to beer. But one of the, the reasons why it adds a bunch of complexity is the presence of different yeast strains and bacterial strains in the wood. You got to be aware of that. Uh, that is why whatever was in the barrel beforehand is extremely important to know and will affect what you're going to have. 
If you're starting with whiskey barrels or, or gin barrels or vodka barrels, well, you're not going to have a lot of those microorganisms in there because the, the, the yeast strains and the bacteria has a hard time surviving in a high alcohol environment. But if you're looking for wine barrels, the alcohol is naturally a lot lower and those bacteria and those yeast strains get to thrive in that barrel, creating a, a very complex beer and great for anything that is, I find, more Belgium style, or in this case, the Flanders Red. Uh, the I, I guess the main four bacteria and yeast strains you'll find in those, and in no particular order, is first off Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is your normal brewer's yeast. It's going to be there. It's going to be there in a, a specific way or non-specific way. You might have added it, you might not have added it, uh, and hopefully it's going to ferment your beer the way you want it to. Uh, the other one you're going to find is uh, Brett. Brett is a wild type of yeast, or at least for a while it was recognized as being, as being wild. Now we kind of recognize it as being just its own thing. Uh, Brett is extremely aggressive in a way. It eats a lot of more complex sugar, therefore generally cleans out your beer a lot more than Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces is going to eat some of it and then stop uh, and not really get to those more complex strains of sugar. Uh, the other two that you're going to find is Lactobacillus. Lactobacillus used for most sours out there and Pediococcus, which is a more aggressive uh, lactic creating bacteria, which is pretty cool. Uh, the reason why some barrel-aged beers tend to be a little more sour is because of the last one, because of, of Pediococcus. Lacto is great uh, and is great in stainless, actually. You don't necessarily need it in barrels, and you can control it with IBUs very, very easily. Last one that I'm going to mention is, is Acetobacter, acetic bacteria. So generally, you're going to want to push one or the other. You don't really want Lacto and Acetobacter to work together to sour your beer. You want one or the other. In this case of Flanders Red, you're going to look for that. You're going to want some acetobacter. You're going to want that vinegar character in the beer. If you're looking to create more of a fruit, uh, fruity beer that has more of a citric kind of sense to it, then you're not going to want that. You're going to want more of that lactobacillus or pediococcus. Now, all of these different bacteria will act in a different time zone. So your Brett generally is very lazy. Therefore, your Saccharomyces is going to start the fermentation making sure that there's enough alcohol so that not too many invasive bacteria are going to develop, at which point your lacto or your PDO is still going to thrive in there unless you've added the proper amount of IBUs. So generally, you can control those bacteria by adding more hops. More hops means more IBUs, and lactobacillus is not a fan of that. Therefore, it's going to stall in its, in its own fermentation and not sour it as much. So you'll have something that's a little more brett for it at that point. Uh, from there, your brett as soon as it generally brett what happens is it it is in a state of hey there's enough sugars around here because you've just added wort to it i don't really have to work i'm gonna, I'm gonna wait it out and then a few weeks after a few a month after or however long after it's gonna go okay now i'm gonna start fermenting i'm gonna start eating i'm gonna start developing this beer i'm gonna start fermenting uh at, at which point it's gonna eat a lot more complex sugars and saccharomyces and kind of you know boost up at that point uh and then and the rest of the bacteria are either not going to develop or going to develop a lot of things to keep in mind with barrels, and I'm going to try to keep this simple, is also the wood and the environment your barrel is in. Uh, I, I've talked a bit about kind of the zones where the different bacteria and yeast are going to start and how to control them with IBUs, but also the environment that they're in are going to affect that greatly. So if you have a more moist environment that is also temperature controlled, well, you get to control the temperature, uh, not the temperature, the, the development of the yeast in there and the bacteria. If you're kind of just leaving it in your front of house right next to a window, well, there's going to be a lot of heat fluctuations. And it's going to create a lot of funky stuff in your beer. Maybe it's something you're looking for, maybe not. Kind of depends on your end result. For Flanders Red, for the Rodenbach especially, a lot of control goes into those barrels. It, it, barrels are very hard to control inherently, but if you can't control the exterior uh, um, the exterior effects of, of weather, of, of the air, of the moistness in the air and the temperature, well, you can control a little bit more what's going to happen in the barrel. And also, if you start using your own lactobacillus, your own yeast strains, and then you try to Promote that in all the barrels in your culture, your house culture at that point. You can control a little more, a little better how the beer is going to perform in that barrel. Uh, barrels are inherently not 
easily controlled, uh, but they do create a lot of very, very awesome flavors to it. It's kind of a different mentality, you know? Stainless, uh, you control every single aspect of it. You create a product that is consistent uh, every single time, or at least that's what you aim for. With barrels, you kind of have to have that open mind where you don't really care, you know? It's, it's not, you're not pushing for perfection, for consistency there. You're pushing for a product that is unique to itself and that is, you know, fun. So uh, this, I hope, helped you guys uh, understand a little more barrel bacteria. Now, Chris, why is this important? Now, what, what does this do to the industry? Why are barrels so popular? So yes, obviously, bacteria in barrels have a huge impact for any brewery in the industry. And the challenge for the industry right now, I think for me, the most important part is training. Also, but training for the staff that's selling the beer, uh, sales people, people brewing it, but also the customers, because that's the people you're selling the beer to. And if they're not aware of what's going on, then you're probably missing the boat and maybe selling to them something that's a little bit too complicated. And you need to kind of like, make it easy on them to learn about barrel bacteria in general and how complex it is because one of the main thing about it is the risk of brewing a beer with barrels. Yes, it can look easy to just put a beer in there, make it age sour, whatever, with the mix you have in there in the brewery and just forget about it for a couple of months or years. But if it turns out bad, what does happen? Yeah, you dump it or you mix it or you blend it but it's all very challenging and it's not something that you learn in tap of a finger or by just watching an Ops and Bros video. And the main part of it is drinking them, sharing them. So blending them beers together, but also buying those bottles, even though they're a little bit pricey, it's part of the process because it takes time, it takes money, but also it takes guts to do it and to not mess it up. This is a challenge. But again, brewers learn a lot from their mistakes and having those brewers out there with this knowledge is fantastic. And collaborations like Alafu are doing is the best way to do it because you bring along breweries that maybe are not used to play with barrels and play with the bacteria. To have them with this knowledge, collaborating with other breweries, it just brings two knowledge together and grows from there. And this is what customers need is breweries with a lot of experience helping small breweries with less experience to bring new product that are very tasty but also easily approachable in the end process to maybe lower that price point to something that's a little bit more affordable for people that are not used to or that want to get into this market of barrel aged sours, barrel aged beer, bread, saccharomyces, lactobacillus very hard terms to get but once you try them all separately it gets engraved in your brain in a way that okay yeah i can see i can sense that there's funk but also i can enjoy it because i know what happened i know the process i know how it got made and i think that's the beauty of beer in general and bacteria barrels it has that nice antique feeling that history behind it and we've built brewery or beer in general through this and it shows through history obviously but also in character in each single different beers that are being brewed by them another challenge that breweries are facing is the not the availability yeah the availability of barrels because you can get barrels from wineries from whiskey from rye from any different distilleries that are using fresh oak barrels I think the Americans is probably the easiest way to get them with the bourbon because bourbon is a single used barrel. So basically once the barrel is done, you can ship it away and it doesn't get multiple usage from its original owner. Wine is different. You can use it a couple of times and from other spirits, it plays differently, but also they all play differently in flavors. I've enjoyed beers with Chardonnay barrels, Pinot Noir, um, then whiskey and then you can play with tequila barrels. It's fantastic how many wood you can select to play with the different flavors in your beer and create a unique experience each every single time but also pair it perfectly with the beer you're blending or the beer you have in mind with it and I think that's the beauty of barrel bacteria in general or barrels. I, I love I love beer and barrels.
that's a, that's all. Good example, Small Pony Barrel Works. If you've never heard about them, they're in Ottawa. Fantastic people, great beers, great sours, and it's basically just a nice brewery built around the fact that they're an assembling brewery. So obviously they can do their own startup base beer, and then after that, put it in barrels to do their own assemblage with fruits, or just simply try different barrels and play with their own styles of beer or try something different. But other breweries get their beer brewed somewhere else and then after that put into the barrels, which makes them basically just an assemblage brewery. And it's getting there. There's a lot of breweries popping up which are a little bit more experimental and playing with those beer, like Robin uh, Bière Naturelle in Quebec, which is fantastic, but also you have um, Bretté Sauvage and Gaspésie that is doing spontaneous fermentation and then putting them in barrels and making them age over a year or more. We don't know because it's coming up this summer, which I'm very excited about too. So with all the added complexity of barrels, I do think that it's worth diving into the subject, diving into those bottles if you have some at your place or in your fridge right now. So crack up your ferro barrel aged beer and Max, now with the end segment of the show. Thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned for next week's video. And while you're at it, please leave a like, subscribe, share with your friends. Every little bit helps. We love doing these videos. And the more people that watch us, uh, the more motivated we are to make more. So uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one.